Welcome. My goal today is to talk about using the option of surgery to treat diabetes. And for some of you, this will sound familiar because the concept was actually validated back in the 1990s. But for many of you, it's going to sound kind of crazy. I mean, after all, how would a person use surgery to treat a problem with insulin, which is a hormone, and with blood sugar levels? Isn't that pretty extreme, even if it works? I mean, is diabetes really that bad? Well, my name is John Pilcher. I'm a bariatric surgeon in San Antonio, so of course bariatric surgery is what I do. And I want to explain to you how the concepts of surgery and diabetes treatment may actually fit together. These days I see two problems with the usual attitudes towards diabetes. First, diabetes has become so common in the United States that our sense of urgency has dropped away. After all, if everyone knows someone who has diabetes, it must be okay, right? Not really, and we'll come back to that. The second thing is that traditional medical treatment of diabetes has been focused, in my opinion, overly focused, on just controlling blood sugar levels and keeping them from going too high, while not doing anything about the ongoing underlying metabolic damage that happens with diabetes. I hope we can renew our sense of urgency about treatment of diabetes and also discuss some new options for treatment. Stick with me, I'm going to explain. The problems I see with the traditional focus on blood sugar levels as the primary way of monitoring and treating diabetes are twofold. First of all, blood sugar levels are actually a superficial manifestation or just a sign of the underlying problem, the underlying metabolic disorder, which seems to be insulin resistance. That's going to be a key concept, insulin resistance, that we will come back to. The second problem with the blood sugar focus is that it misses the fact that diabetes is adversely connected with a number of other medical conditions that also come from this insulin resistance problem. These other medical conditions that often go with the diabetes and exacerbate the diabetes include the obesity disease, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease linked to heart attack and stroke, systemic inflammatory changes, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and acanthosis. I think it makes sense to think of this connected set of medical problems as the mythical multi-headed hydra. In this image, insulin resistance is the core problem at the heart of the beast and all of these other conditions such as diabetes and the obesity disease and blood pressure and cardiovascular disease, these are the multiple heads of the beast. And the problem is with the old fashioned treatment plan is that if you get the diabetes head under control, you're not taking care of the underlying problem and the other parts or the other heads of this hydra medical beast will continue to cause progressive damage. This image helps you understand what I mean when I talk about getting to the root of the disease, which we are saying is insulin resistance. So if you just control the blood sugar and you say that you have the diabetes under control, you haven't fixed the blood pressure problem, you haven't fixed the obesity problem, you haven't done much for the inflammation problem or the cardiovascular problems over time. In addition, the pancreas is continuing to work overtime because when there is insulin resistance, the pancreas needs to make extra insulin to compensate for the resistance of the insulin, and eventually the pancreas will burn out. Ironically, many of the diabetes medicines that are used to control blood sugar levels actually lead to more weight gain. And what does weight gain do? That leads to more insulin resistance, which circles back to worsen diabetes and onward and onward in a vicious cycle. Now, I hope that my complaints about traditional diabetes care show up without blame for the patients who have diabetes and also not blame for their doctors. Traditional medical treatment of diabetes simply has not had tools in the past for doing better than just keeping a lid on the blood sugar levels. But there are better ways to treat the diabetes, and I hope we're going to think hard about those better ways because diabetes really is a bad disease and it affects a lot of people. If you're still with me, I should clarify. This entire video is about the condition called type 2 diabetes, which is sometimes called adult onset diabetes. I think a better name and one that I'm going to use going forward is insulin resistant diabetes, not only because that captures the underlying problem with diabetes itself, but it helps us understand that diabetes is connected with these multiple other medical conditions. And in fact, type 2 diabetes or insulin resistant diabetes is far and away the most common type of diabetes in the United States, and it's 95% of the people who have diabetes have this insulin-resistant type of diabetes.
The other important connection that I want to bring into the video as a bariatric surgeon is the connection of the obesity disease with diabetes. And it turns out that the obesity disease is unfortunately common in the United States and of people with insulin resistant diabetes, 90% also have the obesity disease. And I've broken this down into a Venn diagram for you so that you can see these substantial overlaps. First of all, I think it's kind of surprising how common diabetes is in the United States. See, that, that circle of the Venn diagram takes up a pretty decent sized chunk in the middle of the population of the United States. The obesity disease takes up an even larger chunk and you can see in the Venn diagram style that there's a substantial overlap of the diabetes disease, again insulin resistant diabetes, and the obesity disease with just a little rim of the diabetes population who don't have the obesity disease. Now we've just seen that an unfortunately large proportion of the United States has this diabetes disease. I think it's also informative, even though it's scary, to notice that the disease is making progress, in other words, increasing over time. Check out this map where the deeper blue is a higher percentage of diabetes, ranging from 2004 through 2012 through 2019, and you can see that the percentage of diabetes is increasing steadily, I would say frighteningly, uh, with a hot spot in the uh, southeastern United States. We can also use geography to point out how the diabetes disease or insulin resistance and the obesity disease run together. In this map, the red alone is diabetes alone, the blue alone is obesity alone, and the purple is the combination of diabetes and the obesity disease. And you can see that, similar to our previous map, the levels of purple and deeper purple are progressing over time, unfortunately. Now, researchers observing this combination of diabetes and the obesity disease have coined a new term that's called diabetes. And uh, nobody wants to have diabetes, but it's kind of good to understand it, and it's a useful term because diabetes does capture the idea that there's this underlying uh, disease condition, insulin resistance, that drives the diabetes and also drives the obesity disease. We've talked about the concept of insulin resistance as a metabolic disease that underpins multiple other disease conditions. We care so much about insulin resistance and diabetes because these lead to ongoing daily damage throughout the body. Much of this damage comes through damage to the nerve system throughout the body and to the blood vessel system, of course, throughout the body. And of course, the blood vessels and the nerves are key to normal function of vital organs throughout the body. And so folks who have diabetes will often show up with damage in the retina or damage to kidney function or damage to the nerves that leads to loss of normal feeling, especially in the feet and the toes. People that have the diabetes condition have substantially higher rates of heart attack, or stroke, or even amputation. People who have diabetes lead lives that are shorter, less healthy, and not as able. As I already mentioned, over a period of years, the progressive damage to the nerves and the blood vessels can lead to organ damage of the retina, the kidneys, um, it can cause blood flow problems and nerve problems in the legs, leading potentially to the need for amputation. Hopefully at this point it makes sense that it's not enough just to get the blood sugar under control, but we need to work on the insulin resistance as well. How do we do this? Well, let's go back to basics. The treatment of any medical condition typically begins with lifestyle modification or lifestyle intervention. And for diabetes, the lifestyle interventions usually are to go on a low carb diet, low chemicals, and to increase activity or increase exercise. And these are very good interventions because they will bring the blood sugar down, they will help the other disease conditions, and they will actually help insulin resistance to a small degree. The problem is that lifestyle interventions alone are typically not powerful enough or impactful enough to fully send the diabetes and the insulin resistance into remission once a person has gotten past prediabetes. So it's very common that medications are necessary. And as I mentioned already, the traditional medicines were somewhat useful for bringing the blood sugar under control, but not so useful for treating the insulin resistance. And the typical medicines very often had counterproductive effects leading to worsened obesity, worsened insulin resistance, and an increasing spiral of difficulties. 
These side effects often left diabetic patients and their doctors with the impression that they were treating the diabetes disease successfully, while the insulin resistance and the obesity disease continued to worsen, and while the pancreas unfortunately continued its progress towards burnout. The situation with pancreas burnout is that as long as there's insulin resistance, the body needs extra insulin to compensate. And the pancreas will do its best. It will pump out extra insulin until the pancreas is overworked over a period of years and then the pancreas fails. Once the pancreas fails, then more medicines are needed. Some of these medicines will be insulin that are administered through injections and other medicines. And these other medicines cause more fat storage, more obesity disease, more insulin resistance, and then back to worse diabetes, requiring more medications. And so pancreas burnout is a significant part of this vicious cycle of worsening disease. Recently, a new generation of medicines has become available that may change the game. These medicines are in the group of what's called GLP-1 or GIP medications, and some examples include Manjaro and Wegovy and Ozempic. These medicines improve secretion of insulin from the pancreas, which is a good thing, but they also seem to improve the body's natural response to insulin so that not as much insulin is needed. In other words, perhaps getting at this insulin resistance problem. And so these medicines not only improve blood sugar control levels, but they go to a deeper level by helping reduce weight. They help improve the obesity disease and uh, perhaps break this vicious cycle of diabetes leading to weight, leading back to diabetes, etc. Now the problem with this new class of medicines is that for many people with medium and advanced stage diabetes, the medicines alone are not powerful enough or impactful enough to put the disease into remission. And this is where bariatric surgery comes in. Just for example, a sleeve gastrectomy leads to a 65% chance of diabetes remission and a gastric bypass leads to a 75% chance, both of these being for the long term. Now there's a different operation, a duodenal switch, that leads to a 95% chance of diabetes remission that lasts for a long time, but the duodenal switch gets there by creating intentional malabsorption or reduced absorption of some food and nutrients. And these bariatric operations lead to substantial improvement in the obesity disease through massive weight loss, and they lead to improvement or remission in multiple medical conditions and they let many diabetic patients have normal blood sugar levels off medicines through improved insulin resistance. And just to be clear, these bariatric operations don't work just by blocking food intake, although that's part of the story. They work on a hormonal level to get to the root of the diabetes problem. I hope this video helps you understand that even though diabetes is very common, it is not okay. And just having good control of your average blood sugar levels is probably not enough. I believe that the right thing to do is to keep increasing the intensity of treatment, potentially including surgery, until the entire disease, including the insulin resistance, is under control as well as possible. 